germ layer. You know that you're going to have to know what's developed out of what. Okay. So what kind of membranes are developed? Chorionic. Chorion and amnion. And that, what can happen if, I mean, that protects the baby, right? It's the membranes inside the, the uterus, it protects the baby. What can happen sometimes if mom's membranes are ruptured for Infection. a long time? Infection. Infection. What do we look for? Fever. Mom's running fever. Absolutely. What would happen to the baby? Tachycardia. Yeah, tachy. Absolutely. Y'all do listen sometimes. What is the purpose of, or the function of the amniotic fluid? Cushion. Cushion. Maintain temperature. Absolutely. I think I heard something else. Build up muscles. What is that? What? Kidney function. Not kidney function. What does it do? Amniotic fluid it helps get rid of the waste. Absolutely. Good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see what else we need to talk about. How many veins? How many arteries in the umbilical? One vein, two arteries. Good. If babies are a vessel, two vessels, what would they be at risk for? Congenital defects. Some of them don't survive. Um, who told me yesterday they had a two vessels? Rosa had a baby with two vessels um, when she delivered. The only abnormality was skin tags. Skin tags. So that's a mirror. I mean, that's that's forward work. Okay. <laughs> Because that could have been lots of other things going because they only had two vessels going. Good, good, good. All right, let's see what else I want to ask you. What is the maternal side of the placenta called? Dirty Duncan. And fetal side? Shiny shoulders. That's so wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so now let's get into fetal circulation. Fetal circulation is a little bit hard to get sometimes. Okay, but what I want you to remember is think about the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood. Okay, because remember the lungs are not in the picture. They're there, and blood supply does go to them. But what does that lung look like? It's collapsed. It's collapsed. So there's no gas exchange happening in utero, is there? None. No gas exchange happening inside those lungs with my baby. So I've got to think about how do I get that deoxygenated blood and that oxygenated blood around all the, the parts. Okay, so let me... Um, our placenta, or the baby's placenta, acts as a, acts as the lung. So the gas exchange is not happening in the lung, it's happening through the placenta. Okay, so O2 is coming in, CO2 is coming out. Um, what I did is I, here, I um, want you to know before we start looking at this little video, that there are several different holes in the patient's or the baby's heart and in the fetal circulation that happen in utero in fetal circulation, but after the baby's born, those holes shut. Hopefully. Some some patients don't, some babies don't shut them off. So when we're thinking about, well, I'll let y'all see that. All right, so one of the things that you're going to see, I get ahead of myself. I just get blanked into this fetal circulation. One of the holes <laughs> is the ductus venosus. So what that does is it actually bypasses the liver. Do you remember our livers are, their livers are very, very immature. They can't metabolize stuff at this point. So there's no really no reason for a lot of blood to go to that liver. So through field circulation, when it comes in, it's going to bypass 
the liver via the duct of the venosa. Okay, so that's one we're going to know. Foramen ovale. That is one of the most, or this one and the next one are one of the most common ones that sometimes don't close after the baby's born. So the foramen ovale is between the right atrium and the left atrium. So there's a hole between the right atrium and the left atrium. So all of the blood is not going to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Okay, remember, that's how it works, right atrium to right ventricle. It's going to go from right atrium over to left atrium. Okay, so, yes. Um, one of my patients, I think, if you look at a bubble study, some of the people down there said, um, like, the large portion of people actually have, still have a really, really small hole in it. Does that not close up? And you have to agitate the saline and push through there, and it's a little micro bubble still across. Oh, cool. Yeah, but that, you know, it could, if it stays a little bit patent, it could <coughs> have the mixing of the oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. But it may not be so bad that yeah, so they're, they're having super, symptoms. Super yeah, powerful. that they're symptomatic with it. So the foramen ovale, mm -hmm. that one is it usually close. You don't really see a lot of people having trouble with that. One, okay. What the one that you really see when babies are born <coughs> is the ductus arteriosus. Patients, some babies don't close their arteriosus. That's the one that bypasses the lungs. So what happens there is that a patient, a baby may have what we call PDA, and that is patent ductus arteriosus. Patent means that it stays open. Okay, it stays open. Sometimes babies have this happen and it stays patent and they have to have surgery to repair it. We watch them for a little bit to see if they are symptomatic. Okay, we're going to talk about um, the shunning of the blood in just a little bit, but it, the patent ductus arteriosus it doesn't close. So, what do you think that you would hear? from a patient who has a patent ductus arteriosus. Murmur. A murmur. Now, have any of you been in a newborn nursery heard any murmurs? Yeah. They, what do they sound like? Like a little swish. Like mm -hmm. it's like a hose and it's like just trying to come out too fast on this. Right, absolutely. It's a swish. So it goes love, sh, dub. Mm -hmm. Love, sh, dub. And that's what you're going to hear. These are very, very common when you listen to that newborn's heart rate. Now, mind you, have you listened to baby's heart rate? They're very, very quickly. It goes 160 sometimes, so it's hard. I know when I was first trying to learn how to listen to baby's heart rate, I thought I was going to get a concussion because I was sitting there going, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't, you know, keep up. So I figured at some point in time to keep myself from having a concussion, I would just use my finger. <laughs> so when I listen to baby's heart rate, I have my finger going like this instead of my head going like this. Okay, the, the shaking baby syndrome. <laughs> so it's very, very difficult, but you've got to remember when you're listening and listen for that love dub. And you're going to have to listen for a little bit to get that rhythm before you hear that murmur. Okay, so that is one thing that as a nursery nurse, I've got to be making sure that I am listening to that because what other kind of signs and symptoms would that baby be showing me if he did have a patent ductus arteriosus? Maybe not, but those think about circulation. Fingernails. Have a blue color around where? Lips. The lips, and that's not good. But we're going to see blue color where? Hands and feet. Am I really worried about that? Do you know what that's called? Where your hands and feet, baby's hands and feet are blue when they're born? Modeling. Acrocinosis. This, this word's going to think y'all are so smart. Acrocinosis. 
That is the blueness of the hands and feet when a baby is born. And do I really worry about that? No. No. Not at this point, <coughs> because what's happening? I just had, this baby was just coming into the world, and he had to close his ductus venosus. He had to close his foramen ovale. Because he's had a certain circulation going on for nine months, right? With those, these three things going on, ductus, I mean, ductus venosus, ductus arteriosus, and foramen ovale have all been open. And as soon as he is born, we want them to shut. So when he's born, he's got to reroute his whole circulation. Where, <clears throat> excuse me, where is the most important place that he needs to reshun it to? The brain. And the to the brain, to the heart, the to the lungs. lungs. The lungs haven't had anything going on, have they, in utero? So really, is the hands and feet the most important thing? No. So that's why you see it. That's why you see it. Babies that have that, that don't close their ductus arteriosus, will have the acrocinosis, but they're going to start showing color changes here as well. That's when I worry. When I've got cenosis around here, I don't worry about acrocinosis of my hands and my feet. So those are the three things that when we look at fetal circulation are happening that don't normally happen in an adult. Okay, we, when we were in utero, yes, this is what's happening. So as the baby's born, all these things have to shut. So what I get is that clear on what, which one of those things, and I can tell you State Board of Nursing is going to ask you about foramen ovale, and they are going to ask you about ductus arteriosus. Ductus venosus, maybe not so much, but that foramen ovale and that ductus arteriosus, those are going to be seen again. Okay? So any questions about what happens here? And I did show, I just think this is a whole lot better than being off. So I've got a little video of what's going to happen in fetal circulation. I'll tell you, if this thing don't work, I'm going to cut. It's not laying down. When I looked at it yesterday, it's not actually linked. It's just a picture of the video. It's supposed to be a link. It wasn't working. It didn't come up. Oh my gosh, I did this. I was so proud it worked. Oh. Yeah, it's not going to work. Okay, so what do I need to do here? Go out to Khan Academy. Uh -huh. Go back to the picture, click on it, and then it's full bar, click format, music. Come here, baby. Come here, baby. I didn't get it when I looked at it when I was trying to mock it. It was just a picture. It was like saving the screen. It was just a picture. Is there something I'm taking a bite of an apple and eating an apple with it? It's just like a dessert. What you need to do is an answer. Before a baby is born, there are a lot of adaptations that we see that allow the baby to take nutrients and oxygen from mom and you know successfully get those nutrients and oxygen to the different cells that need them in the you body. The light switch. So what I wanted to do is kind of draw out for you in one diagram all of the kind of things that we see before birth. These are all the things that are happening 
while the baby is still in the uterus. Sometimes we say in utero. So before birth, what do we notice? Well, this structure over here, this is our placenta. This is you know, partially mom and partially fetus. So the placenta has mom's blood kind of pooling in this area. And the baby actually sticks its little capillaries inside of that pool of blood. And you can see that the purplish blood is kind of going in and the reddish blood is coming out. And essentially what I was trying to draw there is that oxygen is getting picked up. So it's actually getting oxygenated. And this blood, as it's kind of reddish, is joining into this blood vessel. Down here. So this is kind of the smiley part of our, our face. And this is our umbilical vein. So this our umbilical vein is actually going to carry oxygenated blood back towards the liver area. So let me actually just jot that name down, umbilical vein. And this is actually the first of the adaptations I was talking about. So I'm going to make a little list of adaptations over here on the side, just so we can keep track of what they are. Adaptations. And the first one will be the umbilical vein. So once the blood goes into the umbilical vein, it has kind of a branch point. You can see that it can either go to the right or the left. And if it goes to the left, it's going to enter the liver. So if it goes kind of this way, it's going to enter the liver, and it's going to take a while for that blood to come out on the other side because it has to go through all the little capillaries in the liver and then emerge on the other side. But there is a shortcut. So the shortcut, let me just uh, circle it here. The shortcut is actually going to be right here. So let me just make sure it's very clear what that shortcut is. This is called our ductus venosus. Ductus venosus. And the ductus venosus is basically going to allow blood to go from the umbilical vein through it. So it's like a little tube. So it is just like any other blood vessel. It's going to go through it. And on the other side, it hits and meets up with our inferior vena cava. So this is our inferior vena cava, I'll write IVC, just for short. And the IVC, or the inferior vena cava, is a large vein picking up blood from the right leg and also from the left leg. So this is our left leg down here. So the inferior vena cava meets up with the blood coming from the umbilical vein, which is very oxygenated. And so this blood I'm going to draw is kind of purplish now because it's kind of got some oxygen, but it's not as rich as what was coming out initially from the umbilical vein because it mixed in with the IVC. And that blood dumps into the right atrium. So this is our right atrium on this side. And simultaneously, you actually have blood from the superior vena cava, or SVC. This is our head and arm region, draining down this way. And this blood also kind of ends up in the right atrium. So you've got this blood kind of mixing. And now I'm going to draw it as kind of a, a deeper purple, because it's mixed up blood. Now, the second adaptation then, let me just make sure I don't skip out on these. This is the first one. The second one would be the ductus venosus that I wrote out, which is, as I said, kind of a shortcut from the umbilical vein over to the inferior vena cava. Now, the blood is in the right atrium, so it has a couple of options. First, it could simply go down into the right ventricle, and some of the blood does that. It just goes right down into the right ventricle. And if it goes into the right ventricle, it's going to get squeezed and once it gets squeezed, it goes into the pulmonary artery. This is my pulmonary artery over here. And we know the pulmonary artery has a branch over to the lungs on both sides. So we've got some blood going to one lung and some blood going to this other lung. But remember, once that blood kind of approaches the lungs, we have to think about what's going on inside of the lungs. So let me draw out what's happening then inside the lungs. You've got these sacs, air sacs, that actually are not full of air. Right? Because when the baby is still inside of the uterus, or when the fetus is in the uterus, it's full of fluid. So you've got these sacs full of fluid, and going past them are little blood vessels. So this is a little blood vessel. Let's say this is an arterial over here. Now, if it's full of fluid, that means there's not much oxygen. So what ends up happening is that there's a process called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And what that means is that the alveolus literally tries to help constrict, constrict 
the arterial. So the arterial has some smooth muscle like this. And because there's no oxygen, the alveolus is going to cause that little arterial to basically contract down. So it basically looks a little bit more like this. And when it looks like that, what we've essentially done is increase the resistance of that arterial. And if this is happening millions of times and millions and millions of alveoli, then the entire lung is going to have a lot of resistance. A lot of resistance in the lung at this point. So if that's the case, if there's a lot of resistance, then a few things we have to kind of deduce from that. The first is that if there's a lot of resistance, then the pressure in the pulmonary artery, remember this is our pulmonary artery right here, these two, I'll actually draw a little arrow to both of them, the pressure in the pulmonary artery is going to go very high. So these pressures are going to be high. And that's simply because you've got a lot of resistance that you have to try to fight against. So they have a lot of pressure. And if there's a lot of pressure in the pulmonary artery, just think back and think, well, where did that uh, pulmonary artery come from? It came from the right ventricle. So for there to be forward flow of blood, you better have a lot of pressure in the right ventricle. And then I could take the argument back and say, well, if you have a lot of pressure in the right ventricle, then you must have a lot of pressure in the right atrium. So you have a lot of pressure basically on the right side of the heart because of the fact that you've got a lot of resistance in the lungs. So these pressures, especially the right atrial pressure, starts getting so high that it starts getting higher than the pressure in the left atrium. And so you get a little bit of blood flow that starts going from the right atrium across that foramen ovale that allows, right here, that allows blood to actually go across it. So this is our foramen ovale. Foramen ovale allows blood to go from one atrium over to the other. And since blood can now go across, you're going to see some of the blood continue down into the right ventricle, but some of the blood will also kind of go across into here. And that's actually quite useful because at the same time that you have blood going across, you actually don't have too much blood coming back through the pulmonary veins. And the reason for that, again, is because it's hard to get blood flow through the lungs because there's so much resistance there. So you have a little bit of blood kind of coming in through the pulmonary veins, and you get some blood coming from the right atrium. Now from the left atrium, blood is going to go down into the left ventricle, and it's going to get squeezed around into the aorta. So now you get blood in the aorta that gets squeezed there, or sent there, from the aorta, or from the left ventricle. I apologize. So the left ventricle is squeezing blood down into the aorta, and the aorta is distributing blood all the way down. Now before I finish off showing you where the aortic blood goes, let's actually make sure I don't forget my list. Over here, my third adaptation then should be the foramen ovale. Foramen ovale, sending blood from the right atrium to the left atrium. And a fourth adaptation, actually I've just kind of sketched out, but I haven't talked about yet, is right here. So you actually have this little, this little guy right here, a little connection, a little vessel, you can think of it as a, a vessel because blood flows through there, between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So this thing right here is called the ductus, ductus arteriosus, ductus arteriosus. So the ductus arteriosus allows blood to go from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And why would blood go in that direction in particular? Well, remember, the pulmonary artery, again, has very high pressures. And the high pressures are because of the high resistance in the lungs. So because of those high pressures, blood, of course, goes from high pressure to a place where there's lower pressure, usually. And in this case, it's going to go from the pulmonary artery over to the aorta. So it's actually going to flow in this direction. Let me just draw a little arrow. It's going to go flowing in that direction. So ductus arteriosus is another, another fetal adaptation. So we've got four so far. Ductus arteriosus. And this actually explains then why you don't get too much blood coming back through the pulmonary veins. Because a lot of the blood go goes into the pulmonary artery trunk ends up going into the aorta. It actually doesn't even go into the lungs because the resistance is so high. So now let's kind of wrap this up. Let's say blood is now down to the aorta, as I said. It's going to go into the legs. 
and it's also going to kind of go into these internal iliac arteries. So I've drawn these arteries here. These are the internal iliac arteries. And there are, of course, lots of branches off the internal iliac. But the important branch that I want to point out right now is this one. This branch, this major one that I'm kind of sketching in, this is actually the, we have a name for it, we call this the umbilical artery. So this is actually bringing blood back towards the placenta. Now, why would so much blood go to the placenta? I mean, that's a fair question. Why doesn't it go, you know, there's a branch here that goes to the bladder, there's a branch that goes to other places. Why is blood going into the placenta branch or the umbilical artery? Why, why so much? Well, it turns out that the placenta, and this is very clever, actually has a very low resistance. Very low resistance. So just as the lungs have a high resistance, and they're kind of making blood divert away from them, the placenta has a low resistance, and it makes blood divert towards it. So you can see now that this is a really ingenious kind of system. We have these five adaptations, the umbilical vein, the umbilical artery now, we have the ductus venosus, and we have the foramen ovale, and the ductus uh, arteriosus. I don't want to miss out on any of them. So we have five important adaptations here, and this is how blood flows in the fetus. mixing of the blood, a lot of deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood, they were mixing together, and it's because of these adaptations, as he called it, that is allowing the oxygenation and deoxygenated blood to mix. Do we mix oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood? No, no we do not. So, it's got to, I mean, you, you see why, because it can't go to the lungs. It cannot go to the lungs. Yeah, and that all that resistance there, it does have some blood flow going there to take oxygen to the actual tissue, but not worried about taking any gas exchange there. So yes, it takes a long time to get those babies' lungs for sure. Absolutely. Question? So, Is this a hard concept? Yeah. A little bit hard so the umbilical artery and the umbilical vein basically take the place of the pulmonary artery and vein for us. Right. Because typically arteries go away from the heart and they're oxygenated. Mm -hmm. Veins go towards the heart and they're deoxygenated. Right. Except for our pulmonary. Right. So there, do we need it to go to? Because why did it, why does our blood go to the pulmonary system? For the oxygen. Before the oxygen. Are we getting oxygen exchange in a utero, in utero? No. No, because it's of the lungs. So that's why we have to have those bypasses to be able to get enough oxygenated blood to where it needs to go so the tissue will be able to live. But I just think it's fascinating that it's it mixes when we don't mix. So now, I mean, it, we mix, but you know what I mean. I mean, we just, we don't mix. So when you look at it in that aspect, can you see why ba when babies are born, how they have to adapt to what ha they have been used to for nine months? And then we throw them into this outside world and say, breathe and lungs work. You know, so it takes a while. So all babies that are born don't look like the Gerber baby. They don't, they have got to go through this transition to be able to make sure that they have oxygenated blood where they need to get it and those lungs are working. That is why you see, and when, um, I don't know if I want to go here or not, but I think it's really important. Did you pick up that he said there's fluid in the lungs? Okay, so we think, oh my God, fluid. We don't want, we don't ever want fluid in the lungs. So how do you think that fluid gets out <coughs> of the lungs? When they cry and cough, the when they're the delivered, they're delivered, they're delivered. They're when they're delivered, they're fluid now. Right. When they come through the birth canal, what happens is when they transition down, that resistance becomes decreased, 
and I can start, when they take that first breath, they start opening up, and as they're squeezed through the canal, that pushes the fluid out. Why do you think they suction that baby right when the baby's born? Because they're going to get rid of all that fluid. Plus, he's been doing what to the amniotic fluid? He's been drinking it and all that kind of stuff. So I don't want that amniotic fluid that's in his mouth to go into the lungs to get it more fluid. Okay, so when they're squeezed through the birth canal, that helps get rid of all that fluid. Now your question is, what about C-section babies? They're not squeezed through, are they? So what do you expect them to have trouble with? Breathing. They have, should have trouble, they may have trouble breathing because they are not getting squeezed through that canal. So they are suctioned extremely more than regular <coughs> vaginal deliveries are. Okay. So I so is that I like y'all can watch that over and over if you can figure out how to do it on your computer. If not, you can go to Khan Academy. <laughs> but I just thought it was really, really neat. Did you see the four adaptations? You see how it's working in the mixing of the deoxygenated blood? Anybody have any questions so far before we go to the next one? How long does it typically take for those adaptations or holes to close? Immediately. Like, immediately. As soon as that baby's born, everything's going to start shutting. Now, mind you, some babies have a hard time. The venosis shuts without any problem. Bramino Valley generally show up, shuts without a problem. That ductus arteriosus is the one that stays patent longer and more. So I'm not going to get, as a nurse, catching a baby... I'm not going to get bent out of shape so much if I first hear a murmur. Why is okay. that one the one that It's been. just hard-headed. It's just a hard-headed. But you got to think about it. It's where it is and what it's letting go by because those lungs have not been expanded. Yeah. So the lungs are now expanded, so it's getting pushed. You know, like, should I shut, right. should I open? Should I shut, should I open? You know, it's not sure what it needs to do. But with that pressure in the lungs, when that pressure, um, the resistance goes down, that's what makes it close. That's exactly what makes it close is that increased pressure in, or resistance in the lungs. Once those lungs, lungs are expanded, it's almost like a fan from the lungs. They're saying, okay, ductus arteriosus is closed. And sometimes babies, i.e. preemies, and you can see that my preemies don't have that because if they don't have surfactant and their lungs are not mature, are they going to have a lot of fan with those lungs? So that patent that this arteriosus stays open because that pressure change is not going to make it shut. Does that make sense? Did your babies have any problems with their ductus? Um, <clears throat> Michael did. He has a large like, lung condition. His retired preemies are something about... Um, they couldn't develop anymore and five even after he was born, I guess because of all the pressure change. Right. So like at one point in time they talked about possibly turning this machine off because when they x ray there was no lung mass in there. But then like miraculously it turned around and he, he was okay. So he had oxygen for a long time. Yeah. And they swore he would have asthma but like <clears throat> That's good though. They, that is another thing that's very, very common in babies that are born early and they have a patent ductus arterius. Now, just because it doesn't close immediately, they watch those children to see if it closes later. So, yeah, so it's not like babies are born, they have a PDA, and they go right to surgery. That is not what, they, they give the babies a chance to do it on their own before they send, because obviously we don't want to send them to surgery. Okay, so we let them, so we watch them a little bit. Um, is there anything nursing-wise I can do to assist this PDA to close? No. All I can do as a nurse is to watch them to see if they're symptomatic and they have respiratory issues, i.e., are they dropping their SATs? Let me get some O2 on them. Okay. Symptomatic, and it's still not closing. Yeah, eventually. But they'll watch them. If they're asymptomatic, that's great. Okay. That's great because they're adapting on their – because the whole thing is, is can they adapt with what has happened in this fetal circulation? 
So they're not going, and I have my, one of my neighbors had hers at five years. So she was five years old because she was asymptomatic for all those years. And then all of a sudden she started showing signs and symptoms of decoloration, you know, being cyanotic, having difficulty breathing when she did any type of walking. So that is when you, I mean, you, it may be up to five years. And it may have been. So it may have been. Was because she had a blood in her heart. Mm -hmm. And over the years, she had to have several different surgeries because I guess when her heart was she started growing, growing, it would get larger. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just what's amazing when I look at this and think all of the things that could have gone wrong, you know, when a baby's born, I mean, oh my gosh. You know, four holes, three holes that were supposed to close. Yeah, then if they didn't close, then I would have trouble with my liver, and my liver would die. Is there anything I can do except transplant that liver? And then my heart and my lungs, all because of little holes that are put in the fetal circulation that have made this happen. So if you don't look at a birth as a miracle, I'm sorry. We, we need to have, come to Jesus thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a strange question. My dad was born with his brain and ovale open, mm -hmm. and his father died of um, heart aneurysm rupturing, and my aunt actually had an aneurysm that ruptured, but hers clotted, so she ended up surviving. Would that put him at a greater risk for having heart problems? I don't, I don't connect that with genetics. I don't, I just think it's just the due, due to the fact that the, each individual person and how the pressure was and how it made it close and how it made it stay open. So I, I can't make a connection right now with genetics. And most patients who have a PDA or have an open foramen ovale, the parents were fine. So I don't think it's genetic. I think it's just one of those things that happen with the process of delivery and the process of the, each individual. But the biggest thing is we've got to watch the symptoms of the child. Can you tell me respiratory issues that you would worry about when a baby who maybe had a PDA? Low oxygen sats. Low oxygen sats. Retractions. Retractions. What's my favorite one? Or not my favorite one. Nasal flaring. Nasal, Nasal flaring and transfusion. Accessory muscles? <laughs> hey, they're confused. How do we know that they're confused? Okay. Accessory muscles. Ooh. Grunting. That is the sign that you are going to see more than anything in babies that have trouble respiratory. They're going to grunt. Uh, uh, and then you're going to go over and say, it's okay. But no, it's not okay when you hear that grunting going on. We've got to make, we've got to intervene when we hear Greg Brown. All right, so Joy, you might need to come get this one. So we see what's happening in fetal circulation. Now my baby's getting ready to be born. And let's see what happens here. Does <coughs> Julia come fix this? You're a bomb. Before a baby is born, there are a lot of adaptations that we see that allow the baby to take nutrients and oxygen from mom and you know, successfully get those nutrients and oxygen to the different cells that need them in the body. So what I wanted to do is kind of draw out for you in one diagram all of the kind of things that we see before birth. These are all the things that are happening while the baby is still in the uterus. Sometimes we say in utero. So before birth, what do we notice? Well, this structure over here, this is our placenta. This is you know, partially mom and partially fetus. So the placenta has mom's blood kind of pooling in this area. And the baby actually sticks its little capillaries inside of that pool of blood. And you can see that the purplish blood is kind of going in and the reddish blood is coming out. And essentially what I was trying to draw there is that oxygen is getting picked up. So it's actually getting oxygenated. And this blood, as it's kind of reddish, is joining into this blood vessel down here. So this is kind of the smiley part of our... our
we've talked about fetal circulation, and I've talked about all the different kind of interesting adaptations that the, the fetus has to make sure it can, you know, adjust to life within the uterus, within mom. But when the baby comes out, let's say the baby is just delivered, there's got to be a lot of changes that happen. In fact, uh, these adaptations, each of them kind of uh, plays a role in the first few minutes, uh, hours, uh, days of life. And so what I wanted to do is kind of go through all of the adaptations, think through them, and see what's happening actually after birth. So we know what happens kind of before birth and, and how the baby adjusts there, but how does this now translate into what's going to happen after birth and what the baby has to do now that it's separated from mom and breathing on its own? And the first two things I want to kind of point out are the idea of uh, what are the big things that are changing? And one big thing is, of course, that the placenta, which the baby has been using for you know 40 weeks or nine months or so, is no longer around. The placenta is removed from the baby's circulation, right? We're gonna cut it away. And the second big thing that's gonna happen is that the lungs get used to bring in air for the first time. So the lungs take in air. So these are the two huge kind of things that are gonna change. And these two things are gonna end up affecting a whole lot of other things as well. So let's get started. Let's see what happens when the placenta gets removed and when the lungs take in air. Let's start with the placenta. So. Let's say that you know you decide that the baby is now delivered and you want to you know cut the cord or cut the umbilical cord and put a umbilical clamp right there. And this is often done, you'll see this done in movies or if you've ever gone to a delivery, you'll see this done pretty routinely. So this is a little umbilical clamp and it's clamping the cord. And you know, if you're ever worried about whether that hurts the baby or the mother, it doesn't because the umbilical cord does not have nerves. So that's kind of the first interesting thing about it. But this stuff, remember, this yellow, pale yellowish stuff that's kind of jelly-like, remember we call this Wharton's jelly. Wharton's jelly. And one of the things that I always thought was really cool about Wharton's jelly is that it's a really interesting mother nature type idea that the Wharton's jelly starts contracting, it gets kind of tighter around the three vessels, the two eyes and the smiley face that I've drawn here which are the two umbilical arteries in the vein, the Warren's jelly starts squeezing around those vessels as soon as the temperature falls. So temperature falls, and remember the temperature in the mom is gonna be much warmer than it is outside of the delivery room, so immediately that Warren's jelly is exposed to cold air, and when the temperature falls, the Warren's jelly starts to contract, causes contraction. And of course, that's gonna squeeze down on all the vessels inside, right? It's gonna basically clamp down on them. And so it's almost like we have this man-made clamp that I drew in orange, but the Warden's jelly is kind of a, a natural clamp that we already have. So we're taking this very low resistance placenta, remember it used to be very low resistance, so a lot of blood liked to flow in that direction, and creating really high resistance. So this is kind of the first big change, is that the placenta gets removed and you go from low resistance to high resistance. So that's a key idea. Now as a result of the high resistance, remember there used to be blood flowing through the umbilical vein, but now in the first few days, there's really no blood flowing through here. All the blood starts kind of clotting off, and that's true even of the ductus venosus. You get some kind of blood clots in there. So you don't really have any flow anymore, and in the first few days, you really completely lose any flow through those things. So this kind of becomes non-used or unused over the first few days of life. Now you still have blood kind of flowing from the portal vein into the liver, and you still have blood going up the inferior vena cava, and this is all deoxygenated blood, so that is still the same as before. And this deoxygenated blood now has no new fresh oxygen to mix with, so I'm not going to color it purple. I'm going to leave it the same blue color. So Deoxygenated blood comes up from the legs, and it comes down from the head and the arms, from the superior vena cava. And now all this kind of deoxygenated blood fills in the right atrium. And some of that blood is going to now go into the right ventricle, so let's color that in blue. And it's going to get squeezed out into the pulmonary arteries from the right ventricle. So let me color that in the same kind of deoxygenated blue color. And this is headed toward the lungs. Now in the lungs, what was happening? Well, initially, remember we had 
these little alveoli, and they're full of fluid, right? And that fluid now is going to get replaced by air. So air is going to push the fluid out. Air is going to push all that fluid out. And what's on the outside? Well, we've got little capillaries, right? So we've got these little capillaries, and the fluid will enter the capillary. But remember, right before the capillary is the arterial. Let me actually sketch it a little bit smaller. The arterial. Because it used to be very kind of constricted. Remember, there's a, that hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. But now that you have air in there, the oxygen levels are rising in the alveolus. And what that's going to do is that's going to send a signal over to the arterial, this is our arterial, to say, hey, it's time to open up now. It's time to finally dilate. So this arterial is excited. It's never really been very dilated before in its life. So it finally says, yay, it's my chance. So it dilates. It dilates like this. And it's nice and plump and big. And when it gets big, what, is that, what does that really mean? It means that the resistance has fallen. Resistance has fallen. So remember, the lungs used to have high resistance. And now, millions of alveoli are causing the arterioles to open up and resistance falls. And this happens, of course, on both sides. So on the left lung and the right lung, the resistance is falling. And that deoxygenated blood now can flow in, right? Because initially, it wasn't really wanting to flow in because the pressures had to be so great. But now the pulmonary artery pressures are falling. It's easier to actually get the blood into the lungs. And that means, of course, the right ventricular pressures are falling and the right atrial pressures are falling. So the entire right side of the heart now is working under lower pressures because the resistance in the lungs has gone down. And now the resistance in the lungs going down, that means that more blood is going to go in. And if it goes in, it's going to go into all the little thousands of capillaries and it's going to get oxygenated, and those capillaries are going to send all that blood back, and it's going to flow into the left atrium. So you have all this fantastic oxygenated blood coming in from both sides, right, going into those pulmonary veins. So now tons of oxygenated blood is dumping into the left atrium, which is different than before because you didn't have much flow through the lungs. So now you've got lots of blood kind of flowing in here. And at the same time, the pressures on the right side have fallen. So if pressures on the right side have fallen, think about what's happening to our foramen ovale. Before, blood was actually kind of gushing through there. But now, because the pressures on the right side are so low, this little flap of tissue, like a little valve, closes off. And so now you can actually see that this flap of tissue will do this. It'll close off because you basically have more pressure on the left side than the right side. And it pushes that flap of tissue over, and now the foramen ovale is basically closed. And this happens actually in the first few minutes. First few minutes after a baby is out of the mom, you actually see this foramen ovale close, which is amazing. Now blood continues to go down, it likes to go into the left ventricle, so it's going to go down here and get squeezed into the aorta. So let me show now oxygen blood for the first time kind of getting into the aorta this way. And then you have the question of the ductus arteriosus. Remember, initially, the reason that blood was moving from the pulmonary artery into the aorta was because the pressures in the pulmonary artery were so high. But now the pressures are pretty low you know, the, the pressures are much lower. And so, if anything, you would actually have flow going this way, right? Because the, the aortic pressures are higher than what the pulmonary pressures are now. But it turns out, interestingly, that in the first few hours of life, you actually have some constriction of the muscles in that ductus arteriosus. So that ductus arteriosus has smooth muscle in the walls. And those smooth muscles are going to sense that now oxygen levels are high. They're going to sense the increase in oxygen levels in the blood. And they're going to start getting twitchy. They're going to want to start constricting. The other thing that the ductus arteriosus senses is that the placenta is removed. Well, how would you sense something like that? Now, how would the ductus, which is over here, how would it sense that the placenta, which is over here, how would it know that it's been removed? 
Well, it turns out the placenta actually makes a, a little chemical called prostaglandin. And when prostaglandin levels fall, when prostaglandin levels go down, then the ductus arteriosus also is more, more willing or able to close down. So those little muscles inside of the ductus arteriosus, remember it's like a little artery in a sense, it's got smooth muscle around it, those muscles are going to constrict, they're going to tighten down when the oxygen levels go up and when the prostaglandin levels go down. It's going to sense that. And so it's going to know that, hey, it's time for me to kind of close up shop and tighten down. And over time, and I'll say over a course of uh, hours, this is going to happen. So let me actually just jot down the time frame for you. So over a course of a few hours, the beginning of constriction will happen. So uh, over time, this will actually get kind of tighter and tighter and tighter. Let me just kind of sketch it out, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You actually have on the inside of it maybe a, a tiny little opening, and then over time a smaller opening, and over time no opening at all. So that's going to happen over the course of the first, or it's going to begin in the first few hours of life. Now, following the blood all the way down, you actually have aortic blood with oxygen kind of flowing down here into the, let's say, the right leg, and into the left leg over here. And there are these branches, these big branches, called the umbilical, or the internal iliac branches, and off of them were the umbilical arteries, right? The umbilical arteries were branches off of the internal iliac. And what's going to happen is that you're going to still get blood flowing to other branches off the internal iliac, like this little branch might go to the bladder. But that last little bit, really, there, there will be no flow through there because the resistance is so darn high. Because the resistance over here is so darn high, no blood is going to want to go in that direction. In addition, the umbilical arteries, just like the ductus arteriosus, have smooth muscle in them. And so that smooth muscle is going to respond to the very high levels of oxygen that for the first time these arteries are seeing, and the low prostaglandins that are kind of circulating, and they're also going to kind of start constricting. So just as the ductus arteriosus started constricting, these arteries also start constricting. They you know, get tighter and tighter and tighter until really there's almost no space in the middle left. And that's how I'm going to kind of draw it fizzling out. So initially they get kind of more narrow, and then they get even more narrow as the muscles in the walls tighten and tighten and tighten, and they finally get something like this. And you still have blood, of course, going to other branches, which is what I've drawn here. But that last little bit going just to the uh, umbilicus that part is going to constrict down, and this process happens over the course of a few hours. So now you have it. You have all the five adaptations and how things change over the course of minutes, hours, and days. And of course, it's not exact, and each baby is different, but these amazing changes are happening soon after birth. Yay. So the people that want to like keep the placenta attached longer periods of time, does that make it take longer for everything to close off? Or is it because it's not attached to the mom anymore? It's, it's still not attached to, to the mom anymore. Okay. So that should that should be fine. I think somebody posted, was it Lauren posted something? Yes, but that was cool. I read that yesterday. That was really interesting. I didn't I didn't realize that it was that prominent here. You know, or it didn't I, I knew other countries and I don't know if everybody saw it, but there were lots of pictures of um, the actual placenta still connected to the baby for days and days and days. Until it fell off. Yeah. It's like I knew people did hours. Yeah. I had no idea. They did it takes voice. 10 days for when we cut it, for the cord to come off, but they were still connected. And um, I thought it was a really, so if y'all hadn't had a chance to read that, it was a really interesting um, thing. I, I knew it was there, but it was one of those things you just sort of push. Because as a labor and delivery nurse, we're not going to do that. I mean, we're, you just you don't see it. Not that we're not going to do it. 
It's just that we, we just don't see it. Uh-huh. Um, I read it too, and it said that it fell off on its own like within two or three days. Uh-huh. Is that because of that chemical being released? Yeah. 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 Well, the prostaglandin is going to be, since it's detached from the mama, the prostaglandin levels are still going to remain in the, the uh, ductus, I mean, the patient, the ductus arteriosus will sense that in these parts. It's not going to still pick up. No, right. it'll, it'll sense that it's not there, but it would be the rest of it to make it fall off. I'm hoping that you will be able to watch that video if you're having trouble over and over and over again. If you're having trouble and can't do it, call Julia. <laughs> Just call Julia, she'll take care of. All right, the next couple um, of slides that I'm that I had, I just sort of briefly went through. You went over this through um, the video that we watched the other day, and so I just sort of briefly went through the weeks again. You're going to have to know those. You're going to have to know those, the, what's happening in the weeks and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going through these. This chart right here is in your book. Okay. And the reason why I like to pull this one out because it's about what parents want to know. And when we talk about pregnancy and stuff, one of the biggest things is education. Moms want to know, when am I going to be able to hear that heartbeat? When am I going to be able to feel him moving around inside there? So I just want to put this as a, um, a mark that's really important, the things that they want to know. Even to the point, they really worry about fingernails and toes. I don't know, I mean, how many times when you see moms deliver and when you deliver yours, you're like, do they have 10 toes and 10 fingers and all that kind of stuff? So it's something they want to know when that's developed. So I just put that one. I thought that one was pretty cool. So we'll um, do that. Okay, so let's talk about anatomy and physiology. Uh, and usually I don't spend a lot of time on anatomy and physiology because um, you have an A and P. But I don't know so much that they went so much in pregnancy. So, I, I did want to hit on these. Um, obviously, we have a uterus. is um, the organ that has the baby, keeps the baby intact. And do you know how um, big a regular uterus is, not pregnant? It's about the size of your fist. <coughs> so, it's really, really small compared to what it's going to get when it's huge and stretched out and have two pounds for the baby and four pounds for the placenta and five pounds full of amniotic fluid. So it stretches out pretty, pretty good. So it, does, it can hold up to 5,000 cc's in that uterus. Um, we talked about Braxton Hicks the other day. Remember we talked about running the marathon. Moms sometimes do not realize that they're having Braxton Hicks. 
And what that is, is just a, usually a, a painless contraction. It may just be to the point where they go, oh, goodness. You know, just sort of feeling like a little menstrual cramp or stronger menstrual cramp. But as far as education-wise, it is something we've got to talk to our patients about. We've got to let them know that if they start feeling any discomfort, and the majority of the times the pain is going to be starting in the back and radiating around to the stomach. Now, you know that I was a preterm mom um, with my son, and one of the things that I, ne I never understood or I never felt was Braxton Hicks. Now, I always told you I'd tell you a little bit of stories about what happened with me in my pregnancy. When I was 25 weeks pregnant, um, I just, you know, I told you I just didn't feel right. I actually had what they call a TOCOS monitor, and it monitored my uterus, like just like when you put moms on a monitor when they're in labor, it monitored my uterus at every hour. So what, or I put it on for an hour at a time. So what I would do is I'd do an hour in the morning, and I'd do an hour in the afternoon. So I would see, it would be able to tell me how many contractions. When I went in labor the first time at 25 weeks, I had 14 contractions and only felt two. So the thing of it is I want you to understand is that sometimes mom may not under, or not feel those contractions because they think, oh, they're just a little bit of a cramp. But no, it is, it is truly contractions happening. The biggest thing that we want to look for I just get so excited. I'm going to tell you all about my story about preacher labor. But anyway, Braxton Hicks are something that you're going to see. Explain to the mama what's the biggest thing that you want to tell her. Is there a pattern there? Is she feeling the title? If there is a pattern, I definitely want her to let somebody know. Okay. All right, the cervix. You know what the cervix is? It is just the bottom part of the pair for what um, that holds the the actual pregnancy in. Now, most of the time, cervixes are very, very long, thin, and closed. You know what I mean by long, thin, and closed? So it's sort of like this, like, see how long my hand is? And see how closed this is? And it's usually, um, Long, thick, and closed. So that's long, and it's very, very thick around there, and it's closed. Because you've got to think of what its purpose is. The purpose is to keep it, the outside world, all the bacteria, all the germs, all the nasty stuff that's out there, to keep it away from my baby. So within the cervix, when you're pregnant, the whole inside of the cervix fills with mucus. So there's two different barriers from the outside world with that cervix. So I need it to be long, I need it to be thick, I need it to be closed, and I need it to be full of mucus. So there's no bacteria, no anything that can get up and disturb my baby. Um, the vaginal, you know what a vagina is? So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But I do want to let you know that when moms get pregnant, the vaginal secretion and the mucosa becomes very thick. Okay? You may also see that they have a thicker drainage or discharge, and it's sort of white. The bad thing, and there again, that's an in infection. I want to prevent infection from occurring and getting up inside that utero. But you've got to remember, bacteria loves dark areas and moist areas. So mom's going to have an increased risk of having a yeast infection because of secretions and the drainage is more um, prominent. So things, what kind of things would you educate her on? Drying clean. Staying clean, yeah. Hmm? White, front to back. White front to back, absolutely. What kind of hand?
panties. Cotton, yeah. cotton. Yeah. cotton. Cotton panties. And a lot of times what I tell moms to do is don't sleep in any underwear at night. Let that thing air out. <laughs> okay? So you're not letting, because all that moisture, you know, think about it. All that moisture, you're all covered up. You're all warm. It's all dark in there. And it just increases their risk. And they don't want a UTI or any type of infection when they're pregnant. It's bad enough being pregnant, much less having lots and lots of other things happen. But eat yogurt is another thing. I want to decrease that chance of her getting any um, yeast infection or any type of infection down there. But sometimes they're alarmed when they see that white um, secretions. They get a little bit upset. They're like, oh my gosh, and what is this? Why is this doing this? Why am I so wet down there? Um, and that's just a part of pregnancy. But I've got to I've got to talk to her about that so she'll know that that's normal and not something to be worried about. All right, our breasts. One of the first things that happens when we get pregnant is our breasts begin to hurt. So a lot of times when people come to me and say, you know, I just missed my period, are your breasts sore? Because they become very, very hard and very, very big. It's almost like I remember the day I found out I was pregnant. I went to bed with no boobs. I walked. I woke up the next morning and I was a double D. <laughs> and I was like, okay, where did where did these things come from? And that's what happens a lot of times. They become very big. They become nodular. One of the biggest things that you will see is that the nipples become larger and they become dark. The villi is very very um, dark. Villi, not a villi. Mm -hmm. Areola. <laughs> I just say um, the areolar becomes very very dark and what it's doing is preparing to breastfeed another thing that you'll see throughout the pregnancy is there will be some leaking of some um, fluid and that is called colostrum um, moms sometimes get but oh my milk's coming in my milk's coming in no it's not your milk that's another thing that we're getting ready to make the milk that colostrum is the most healthiest fluid you can ever imagine it has got every nutrient it's got everything but they may start leaking a little bit and a lot of times i tell them don't worry about leaking like that that's your breast getting ready and your milk gland and a lot of them are like, what am i going to do with it i usually just tell them to rub it around their nipples it's very, very thick, and a lot of times their nipples get cracky and they get sore when they're pregnant because, like I said, some people go from having no boobs to having a bunch of boobs very quickly, and the skin starts getting taut and the stretch marks start coming. Just rub that colostrum on that nip. Just, it's excellent for your skin. And we'll talk more about, um, well, Miss Morton will probably talk more about colostrum and breastfeeding and all that kind of stuff. All right, respiratory. One of the biggest things that moms always complain about is they got a snotty nose. For some reason, they get this respiratory junk going on when they're pregnant. And sometimes um, they may even have nosebleeds. So let them know, because that's sort of scary sometimes to know that you got a nosebleed, you're not sure. And there again, it's because of all that uh, hormones. Everything with pregnancy is hormone based. The estrogen, the progesterone, all the reasons we're having all of these changes going on is hormone. It's hormone based. Um, cardiovascular, you know that their blood volume is going to increase tremendously. Those are the ones that if you had never started an IV, when you go to labor delivery, please try to start an IV on somebody that's pregnant because their blood volume is so much more than a regular, and they have lots and lots of veins and increase that blood volume. So start that IV on somebody that's in labor and you'll be very confident because you know that you're gonna win. Cardio, uh, cardiac output increases. We may see our pulse be a little bit of elevated and there again, that blood pressure. Now I'm talking the <clears throat> normal pregnancies, not disorders of pregnancy, because there are disorders of pregnancies that can make your blood pressure go out the wazoo. 
but generally we've got a, the, the blood pressure will start just settling down a little bit, but that heart rate may still be up a little bit, okay? But normal, and I'm not talking about disease processes, because we're going to talk about pregnancy-induced hypertension later. Nausea and vomiting, GI, usually seen early, early, early. Tell me some things that you could do for patients to help with that nausea. Ginger. No, ginger. Ginger? Ooh, good. Zofran. Huh? Zofran. Zofran. Let's stay away from ginger. Small, frequent meals. Carbs. Absolutely. What do you want to tell them to do before they ever get out of bed? Eat some crackers. Eat, get some crackers, some juice, something. Get something on your stomach before you even get out of the bed. Yes. Oh gosh. Now there is a disease um, or a disorder called hyperemesis, mm -hmm. and that's strictly for pregnancy. But Ms. Moore is going to talk about that. So I think I'm that runs higher. Yeah, it does run higher. Hormones. Double, double hormones. And the nausea, and the nausea and vomiting is true. I mean, it's, it's real. And there's nothing that you can do about it. I remember I was working labor and delivery when I was um, pregnant with Ashton in the midnight I mean, hours, like the third shift hours. And I can remember saying, looking at my patient saying, I'll be right back. And I would actually go in her bathroom and vomit because I couldn't make it to the bathroom. And I'd say, I'm sorry, I've got to vomit. I'd vomit. I went and brushed my teeth, and I'd come back and start caring for her again. So it was like, it's, it's true. They even have these um, bracelets that do pressure with mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And they're, um, I had to get those when I went on a cruise. What are they called? C bands. C bands. They can get um, those that get spalming patches behind them. It really is true, but we've got a. So there's all kinds of things that we can research to get out there and help because. Some people say, oh, God, you're just throwing up. You'll be all right. You're pregnant. No, no. It really is true, but it can also lead to dehydration. And we've really got to watch moms. We've really got to, because they're going to have to double their fluid. I mean, they need to be drinking a lot because that baby's going to take everything from them. Um, have you ever heard of people that had gallbladder problems with their pregnancy? Anybody have gallbladder problems? Actually, I have a gallbladder problem. You killed your mama's con. She said I killed my mom with gallbladder. I actually had a um, my first one. I had a gallbladder attack while they were doing my feet. Oh my gosh. And they knocked me out. Like I couldn't breathe. Oh my gosh. So it was like eight hours later before I got to be ready. Oh my gosh. Did you have to go get your gallbladder taken out right then or did it wait? They didn't know that's what it was. So I ended up going after she was born on the sick side to emergency right. room. And it's very true because the emptying of your gall salt, your gallbladder, is very delayed, and it does truly cause gallbladder problems. So when moms are telling you that they have this pain right here, and it feels like somebody's stabbing them from here all the way back, we need to listen to them because the gallbladder, having a pregnancy and having to have your gallbladder taken out, is very very common. So we need to if they're showing me signs of you got to listen. Urinary, oh my goodness. Think about this. How many problems, I mean, women have to pee anyway all the time, I think. But when you're pregnant, at the very, very beginning, remember the uterus is a pelvic organ, which is right there with the bladder, right? And as it begins to grow, and grow, where is it sitting on? It is sitting right on your bladder, and you feel like you cannot hold it at all. So one of the biggest issues with moms is they have to pee all the time. The one good thing is that we'll tell them that after the first trimester into the second, it gets better. And do you know why it gets better? Because the uterus now becomes an abdominal cavity. It's an abdominal cavity. So it's an abdominal organ. So it's not pressing 
right directly on that bladder. So the urinary frequency during the second trimester has decreased a little bit. But then you gotta give her the bad news again. Because with the third trimester, the baby's gonna start coming down and become a pelvic organ again. And we're gonna have more trouble with holding our, our urine at that point. Mamas that um, are in the first trimester, in the last trimester, if you ever see one out shopping, move out of the way. If they're on a mission, they're headed to the bathroom. Can you still bladder scan for someone? Yeah. Yeah. Can you still bladder scan for me? Yeah. Sure. 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 Sure.
I know when I was pregnant with both my kids, I would send my husband, I'd be watching TV or watching, you know, something, and there would come a commercial and say, this is excellent for stretch marks, and I'd send my husband to the store. <laughs> Go give me that. He'd come back, I'd use it, and it didn't work. So, anyway, I don't know that maybe we could just work it. Alright, so it's, <laughs> it's stuff right there and their center of gravity does change so they fall a lot and a lot of times they're a little clumsy when we're pregnant you know we just like sometimes we don't have any sense there's um a, we used to have a joke on ob or labor delivery as soon as the mama delivers her placenta the brain goes with it <laughs> it's like you don't feel like you have any sense whatsoever about doing anything because you're like, oh, yeah, sure, wow, give me the baby, whatever I need to do. But you sort of feel like that sometimes when you're pregnant. You're like, I can't think straight as well. But the month that has nothing to do with muscular skeletal. But think about the change of, you know, I get on my little tangents. So I get, I'm glad that y'all deal with my ADD. Real her back in. <laughs> Real her back in somewhere. All right, I promised Mrs. Moore that I wouldn't go into labor and delivery anymore. But I've lied to her. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Taylor, I lied. All right, most of you about the joint. The other thing that you got to think about is that the pelvic areas are trying to adjust to getting ready for pregnancy. Because what happens when they get ready to deliver, those pelvic muscles move, and those pelvic bones move to get ready for that delivery. And we'll talk about the different things that they check to make sure to see if your your um, pelvic area is big enough to have that baby. We'll talk about that later. Um, one of the things that we see lots and lots is the abdominal muscles begin to separate. As the pregnancy progresses, the abdominal muscles can't handle it sometimes. So what happens is the abdominal muscles, muscles begin to separate, and it almost looks like they have hernias. Lots of moms have to have surgery after this to repair it, and it's very painful. So mom, and generally we see it on moms that have large babies, large babies, 10 plus pounds are the ones that we see that have, that that muscle actually just rips right open. Mm. So it's very painful very uncomfortable and um, moms want to fix it as soon as possible. Alright, uh, central nervous system, that's what I was talking about. You have a decreased attention span and sometimes you just don't can't concentrate. Maybe that's what's wrong with you. Maybe I'm pregnant. <laughs> I can't concentrate so um, be patient with them as far as education. Don't overload them with a bunch of stuff because sometimes they can't keep their uh, attention span. Of course, our metabolism is going to increase. They're going to want to eat everything in their baby. You know what I mean? They're just wanting to eat everything. I didn't mean it in the baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that they're, I hear this all the time, I'm eating for two, I'm eating for two. 
that's not necessarily the truth because that baby's going to take everything from you when you're pregnant that it needs. It's going to get everything. There's not a reason for that mom to eat 14 Snickers because she thinks that her baby needs this Snickers. Okay? Our, and every mom has tra their cravings when they're pregnant. They have it. My craving was cherry lemon sundrops and strawberry yogurt. Great. I don't know why. Together or? Together. Had to be together. <laughs> Um, so, and luckily there was a little yogurt stop right down here uh, and right beside Whataburger when I was pregnant with Ashley. <laughs> no, not generally drop. It usually goes up a little bit because that baby's going to take everything from you. So you've got to really, really watch your, she asked the question about her blood sugar going up. It's going to take everything, so you've got to really, really watch it, and you've really got to watch your diet. And moms with pregnant in pregnancy, yes, I say, you know, if, you, if you're craving something, then maybe your body's missing something, but we can take it to the extreme. I've got to tell mom, weight gain is so important. We've got to make sure they don't gain 65 and 70 pounds. That is, that, that's so unhealthy. So now we're looking at the obesity. Who, ha who watched the delivery of that obese patient the other day? The C-section. How, how much did she weigh? Guesstimate. I thought you said she was obese. She, I mean, I knew her prior to. Oh. I what didn't think that was that big. <laughs> Was she really, really, I mean, really, really, really large? Somebody was telling us about their experience. Yeah. Deborah, yeah, right. yeah, over the weekend. When you lay on the table, like the baby kind of like shifted to one side, mm -hmm. and you could see it, like he's laying on the left side. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. It was, it's, oh, yeah. she was there. Yeah, big baby. Big baby and big mom. She was a big Yeah. Well, see, that's not a real big baby. Which is weird because we were able to have a small baby. Yeah. Mine was well over. This is a labor and delivery question, but whenever <laughs> they have a C-section one time, is it common for them to get in the press? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it is. Because mine had had four children who were all C-section. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I guess I just assumed that you would not have a C-section. Well, it depends on the reason why you had the C-section. For instance, if it's a breach situation and you had to have a, a C-section the first time. So... The, if it is a breach, you've got to have a C-section first one. You can't deliver. They won't let you deliver that way. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, the, the other ones, they can choose to what we call a V-back, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean. And if it was just a breach situation the first time and the second time the baby's head down and can come out, they will let that mama labor. But she's at risk for rupturing that uterus. Okay. Now, with her fourth one, absolutely not. I would never, ever, ever let um, or encourage a mother to be a V-back 
if she's had four because that uterus has been cut how many times and repaired how many times and with if I contract and contract contract eventually it's like a rubber band that rubber band's gonna pop and so I don't want to so it's good it's still a good question I I love my lady Cesarean, and it's scary. It's scary. It really, as a labor delivery nurse, I get really scared. Well, you could have passed the other one, so they always don't have a first one. So the second one, you have like the event. Yeah. They try, yeah. And, and that's called failure to progress, and I hate that term. I hate failure to progress because it's just saying that the mom could not dilate all the way to 10. But that's what they call it. So if she couldn't dilate the first time, they've got to give her a chance the second time to do it. The third time they didn't. Yeah. But if she's got two times that she did not progress and not dilate her cervix, then she shouldn't have to go through it a third time. But that second, and even what's really sad, is insurance. And she just don't have pain yeah, and that's insurance. They're not going to let her take, go straight in and have a C-section. So, and it, that stinks. Do y'all know how I feel about saying the insurance? All right, so we don't want mom to um, gain a lot of weight. One of the biggest things that we look for in pregnant moms is to see how much water <laughs> retention they're going because, or they're, that are happening because edema is normal to some degree with pregnancy, but it can get out of hand. We can get too much edema going on. And then if we have a lot of edema in the lower extremities and in the hands and stuff, that could predispose my patient to what they call pre uh, pregnancy induced hypertension. That's one of the symptoms that you see at the very, very beginning to diagnose that disease process. So we're looking, we've got to maintain. Now some moms, let's say they work 12 hour days. As a nurse, how, how do your feet feel after 12 hours? <laughs> and you're not pregnant. So you can imagine how, they're gonna have some degree of swelling, but we've got to keep up and we've got to be on top of these moms and let them know that let me know how long you were up on your feet before the swelling started. Now, if you worked a 12 hour shift and your feet started swelling a little bit when you got home, I'm not really concerned about that because I'm not pregnant and my feet would be swelling. But if I have somebody who's on the floor or working somewhere and within an hour, they're, they're noticing feet swelling, then at that point I need to get them to where they can sit down and put their feet up to decrease that swelling, swelling, okay? So we'll talk more and more about anemia. Um, all right, so let's get back here. I think we can get through. This is more or less one of those things like the germ layers, that it is what it is. When, you know, everything that's um, formed <laughs> in the endo is what it is. Signs of pregnancy, this is another thing to say before I y'all know. Um, signs of pregnancy, they're in three different categories. Presumptive is the first category. That's more or less subjective information from the mom. Did she feel um, things that mom's telling me, my breasts are getting larger. There are more nodules in my breasts. Um, I noticed that my have skin pigmentation changes. I noticed that I don't have a period. I don't know about y'all, but when I had a period, I knew exactly when I was going to start. And if I missed by one day, I was panicking. Oh my gosh, don't make me do this again. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I'd have taken four or five more. Um, they may have the frequency of the urination. 
um, nausea and vomiting, very, very tired. So all of these are things that mom's going to tell me that she's felt. And that is just presumptive <coughs> changes. Okay, we're just presuming that she might be pregnant. Probable is more objective. So <coughs> along with, it, it doesn't mean that she's going to have every one of these, but they can have some um, presumable and some probable. But when you look at the probable, they are several different things that by an examiner, by a nurse, or a uh, MD, that he can tell you. When you look at the cervix, remember I said long, thick, enclosed. Okay, it's also hard. So when you feel, when the examiner does a vaginal exam and feels that cervix, when you're pregnant, it begins not open up yet, but just becomes softer. So when they actually touch the cervix, it's not feeling like this table right here. It becomes more mushy. And that sign is called Goodell's sign. So when, and it has to be felt by an examiner. You follow me? All the, all the doctor does or the nurse does does a vaginal exam feels the cervix and the cervix is not feeling like this, it's feeling very, very soft. That is a probable that patient may be pregnant. The other thing, another sign that may happen um, is Chadwick's sign. The actual cervix is going to be uh, bluish tint. As the pregnancy becomes probable, then the cervix is going to become softer and it's going to become um, bluish. Now, most of the time we think blue is not good. Well, blue is okay for a cervix when you're pregnant. Okay. The next one is Hager sign. I don't think I have that right. <laughs> it's a Hager sign. Does it say cervical softening too? <laughs> Oh, it's the uter the lower uterus segment. Yeah, I didn't write that right on there. That's not right. It's the lower uterine segment of the uterus, not the cervix. That's their own. Hanger sign is the lower segment of the uterus becomes softer. Softer. And that is also felt by a doctor. Okay. The next sign is obviously a positive urine test. That's still probable. Okay, urine, blood would be positive. Let's get there in a minute. So urine is still probable. Okay, not confirmed yet. Braxton Hicks. Also, um, we've talked about Braxton Hicks. The other thing that is very, very, is a probable sign is called lobotomist. Um, that is when the actual uh, doctor puts, does a vaginal exam and they can actually push the baby or the fetus away from the cervix and away in the baby's movement. So I can push it. You'll see that more when, like when they're in labor and delivery. For instance, if my baby's not moving a lot. A lot of times I'll do a serial vag exam and I'll tickle this baby's head to get it moving and make it move up. He's not engaged yet. I can move him a little bit. Okay, so that's a lot of it. All right, so those are all just probable signs and positive signs. Positive signs is actually visualizing the fetus via ultrasound, um, any other kinds of ways I can look and see, um, feel heart tones by the ultrasound or with the Doppler that's confirming that I have fetal um, heart tones and actual fetal movement felt by the, the physician where they're actually putting their belly on their hands on their belly and feeling that baby move. So that is really, which I think that's a little bit. I would know that I was pregnant before this. 
<laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, the ones like that. So, but anyway, these is what our research tells us, our sources tell us that it is presumptible, probable, and then positive. So those are divided into three different categories, and that's one of those things that you just have to memorize which one is which. Okay, any questions about Probable, presumptible, positive, stuff. I only, um, let's see, I had, a, I had a goal of where I got, and I didn't get there. Oh, I can show you this. I made this, or I didn't make this. I think this is the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Um, it actually goes, here's a little bit about the placenta and the different hormones and all the things that we just talked about, about what happens, like here's our skin issues, vaginal issues, GI problems, breast problems, respiratory, nutrition. Um, one of the things I will tell you about nutrition, it's very, very important that moms get high in iron and folic acid. Folic acid is something that we don't really push a lot of people to take, but during pregnancy, it's very, very important because folic acid can cause, or a decrease of folic acid can cause neural tube defects and cause a lot of defects. So we need to make sure it's not the cause of a miscarry. We don't um, keep your folic acid levels up. So those are some I really need you to, to realize that folic acid is important with pregnancy. Also, we didn't talk about the calorie intake. You need to increase, or the pregnant moms need to increase their calorie intake by 300 per day. It's really, they do need more calories to deal with the pregnancy. Um, and we've talked about the duck wobbling and the heart problems and the urinary. <coughs> and the size of the uterus and all that stuff. So I thought that was pretty good to help y'all remember all that stuff we just talked about. Okay, the only place, I didn't do too bad. Well, you can on the number one again, neural tube defects. All right, the only other thing I want to tell you is on page 171, there's a lot of terms that are on that page. I did not um, put them all on the PowerPoint, but they're just terms like antipartum, um, prima gravita, gravita, all of those good bunch of terms. I want you to read over those so in the morning I can ask you if you have any questions about those terms and understanding those terms because I'll start using those terms a lot. Okay? <clears throat> yes.